What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Alright, so, All New Wolverine finally allows us to get caught up with the current story arc. Remember, these stories come out monthly, so when it's a six issue story arc, it takes six months for it to finish, uh, which is... Man, not really sure why Marvel's still doing that trend, but the interesting thing about X-23 being Wolverine is that it's a huge so uh, source of contention. Either you love the idea, or you hate the idea. I personally love it. I love the idea of X-23 being Wolverine. It was the next most logical step. James Howlett had to go away at some point. I mean, the guy had appeared in 12,000 some odd comics by the time he came to an end. I mean, it was it was time for him to go. And it made sense that X-23 was going to be the one to take his place. But keep in mind, up to this point, under the writing of Tom Taylor, he's emphasized a lot of her character in terms of building her up and establishing her role as Wolverine. The issue with this is that going into Secret Wars and coming out into all new, all different Marvel, a lot of questions have been unanswered. A lot of uh, plot threads just really hadn't been wrapped up with like the character of Kimura who had indestructible skin, the one thing that Adamantium couldn't cut through. Um, it, it had a lot of unanswered things that were going on. And so what Tom Taylor does is begin the process of answering this. Now keep in mind, this takes place post Civil War II. And so where the Civil War II story really just kind of saw X-23 fighting Old Man Logan under the idea yeah, that in the Old Man Logan universe, Gabby, who was, you know, in this all-new, all different Marvel universe, basically a clone of X-23, where Gabby would go on to become this very vindictive, very cruel young girl who would turn X-23 against Logan. You know, Old Man Logan tries to basically prevent that from happening. And again, that really just ties into the Old Man Logan concept of him trying to stop his future from happening. But as soon as he saw Gabby, he saw her as somebody who was just an inherently evil character. And so what this did is it basically sent X-23 uh, really against Old Man Logan. And at the conclusion of their fight, X-23 said, the superhero community is in shambles right now. You guys are fighting one another. You guys are pretty far from having it together. And so she basically said, myself and Gabby are going underground. We're taking off until we can figure out what we want to do next. And so what this does is it kind of continues that trend of them just constantly moving, of constantly going and, uh, you know, being on the road, being on the move, constantly, you know, leaving. Now, of course, in their journey of packing up and their process of kind of getting things together, Gabby had stumbled ac across the trigger set. And the cool thing about this is that Tom Taylor just kind of gives us this quick rundown of what the trigger set is because, you know, X-23 says, put that away. Do not allow me to be exposed to that trigger scent in a populated area like New York City. And when Gabby asked the question as to why, X-23 says, because the trigger scent is what sets me off. You know, she says, basically, whenever I'm exposed to the trigger scent, it was engineered and I was engineered in such a way that I basically black out. And when I wake up, everybody around me is dead. Whoever happens to be around me during that time frame is dead. And so the crazy thing is that X-23 is not herself. It's basically the X-23 equivalent of James Hallett going into like his animal state, you know, going into a, a bestial state, you know, sort of losing his mind and, and, and becoming wildly insane. But what that does is it allows Tom Taylor to create a scenario where it will eventually allow X-23 to basically overcome it. Now, again, X-23 also provides a little bit of a, of a backup story here when she begins talking about Kaimura, about how Kaimura was the handler of X-23 when she was part of the facility, when she was being cloned, that Kaimura herself was basically engineered by the facility to keep X-23 contained. And now, as far as I'm aware, I don't think we're given the actual specific specifics in terms of what the facility did to her. All we know is that Kaimura was basically a woman whose life was marred in betrayal, where she had experienced brutal scenario after brutal scenario from different men and different people throughout her life, and it made her a very dark and a very cruel person. And the result was that when she had come across the facility, and when she had been inducted into the ranks of the facility, she was exposed to a process that made her skin indestructible to everything, including adamantium. So think of her as like a more extreme version of Luke Cage. Uh, the issue with this is that this was done explicitly to have someone who could control X-23, who could basically break X-23, you know, break her of her rebellious ways and force her into subservience with the facility itself. Now, of course, we didn't find out about uh, about about Kaimura until Target X, until the second story arc following X-23's origin. And so, you know, when X-23 first popped up, Kaimura was someone who had never existed. We'd never heard of her. She just wasn't added in until later on. But again, you know, with Kaimura's introduction into Marvel Comics, she'd always been this kind of bad guy, this main foe of X-23 in the sense that where Laura had basically taken off after her escape from the facility, she had come across her creator's family, you know, Debbie and so on and so forth, and she had tried to live a normal life, Kaimura's pursuit of X-23 for Kaimura's own use eventually led to the two of them going into conflict time and time again, where even when X-23 joined X-Men, when she became part of X-Force, uh, Kaimura was still chasing after her, still trying to kidnap
kidnap X-23 and use her for her own ends. And so what happens is the journey of Laura and Gabby eventually takes them to a little a little town of 30 people called Dalesville. And what ends up happening here is that the entire town has lost power. And what we learn is that Kaimura and her forces have been following Laura Kenny, have been following X-23 alongside Gabby. They never lost them. And what they're doing is they're basically launching bomber planes. So these are not bomber planes in the traditional sense of like dropping physical bombs because it wouldn't kill X-23. Instead, what they do is they basically bombard the town with trigger scent. And the reason why is because no matter where X-23 went in this town, she would be exposed to the scent and she would lose her mind, meaning everybody in this town is going to die. And that's exactly what happens. We actually end up picking up with S.H.I.E.L.D. led by Nick Fury arriving on the scene only to find that X-23 has killed every single person in this town. And so it's really cool the way this the way this unfolds is because again, this is really Tom Taylor kind of hitting home with the trigger set, hitting home with the idea that X-23 doesn't control her so it doesn't have the ability to control herself. Now, this presents some, some interesting moral quandaries, especially when it comes to the idea of responsibility for one's actions. If, for example, you take someone like X-23 and you basically expose her to a trigger set that sends her into a feral state, that sends her into a bestial state where she does not have cognizant awareness of what she's doing. She just devolves into an animalistic rage and attacks everything. Is she really responsible for her actions? In the same vein that if you had a guy with multiple personality, one personality named Steve, one personality named John, John is violent, Steve is, is kindly, John takes over and kills people. Is Steve, is the person really responsible for, her, for his actions? That's the kind of question that's being posed here. Now, with X-23, it's a little more cut and dry than it is with like a person with multiple personality disorder in the sense that one, X-23 was created and she was engineered as a weapon. So in reality, she never really had a chance to live a normal life in the first place. And two, it's not Laura intentionally committing these actions. And that's kind of the, the moral ground that Tom Taylor's walked on here. That's the question he's kind of asking us to ask ourselves. Like, you know, is she responsible for her actions when she's exposed to the trigger scent? Now, of course, following these bombers with X-23 basically saying, hey, look, somebody dropped trigger scent here. It wasn't my intention to do this. You know, following it with, with S.H.I.E.L.D. tracing these bombers down, they eventually come across, of course, a massive warship just sort of floating in the sky, which which we know is basically led by uh, by Kaimura. The issue with this is that the warship is basically within the sovereign territory of Madripoor. Now, Madripoor is a, is a location that's been running in Marvel Comics for quite some time. And to be honest, I'm kind of disappointed that we haven't seen it yet in like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or in the Fox Universe, whichever place owns the rights to it in film form. But Madripoor is like, it's man, it's in no man's land. <laughs> Madripoor is like the one place that S.H.I.E.L.D. won't go. And the reason why is because it's the Wild West. Madripoor is a sovereign nation run by criminals and owned by criminals. Now, recently, Madripoor has kind of been taken over by a woman named Tiger, who's actually wanting to move it into more of a, more of international grounds and take it away from being this sort of, you know, clandestine, obscure place that people just disappear into. But the overall theme of Madripoor remains, it's a sovereign state. And so because of that, S.H.I.E.L.D. cannot just show up in Madripoor, otherwise it would lead to an international incident. But the issue here is that they're trying to track down X-23. And so, of course, Laura's able to engineer her own escape. Uh, but the issue is that once she gets back to where Gabby's located and the two of them begin talking, then, of course, Laura says, look, we have to find a way to get to Madripoor proper. We have to find a way to get to the, get to his location. Of course, you know, X-23 breaking out of S.H.I.E.L.D. custody now makes her an enemy of both S.H.I.E.L.D. and Madripoor, or I guess, of uh, this, this vessel itself. And so because of this, she's really just, you know, X-23 is really just an enemy of the state. Now, that's where the story really differs. To be honest, the title Enemy of the State is really borrowed by Tom Taylor for the sole purpose purpose of just really the popularity of it. And what I mean by that is the, in the original Enemy of the State story with James Hallett, with Wolverine, what had happened was he had basically been kidnapped by Hydra and the Hand. The two organizations which had, you know, ties for a while, basically joined forces in their entirety. Hydra being, you know, a branch off of, uh, of Nazi Germany that didn't really hold with traditional Nazi ideas, but still wanting world domination, allied itself with the Hand, this mystical, you know, really, really obscure ninja organization that was founded by, uh... God, I can't remember his name. Yoshioka. I can't remember what his first name is. Uh, Kaganatu or Okanabu Yokiyoshi. I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head. You know, Hand was an organization that existed behind the scenes and served the purpose of influencing the world through subterfuge and stealth and assassinations and so on and so forth. Uh, Kaganabu Yoshioka. That's what it is. Um, but the idea is that, uh, you know, with, with regards to X-23, stowing away aboard a pirate ship, it gives them ability to basically sneak into Madripoor. The issue is that, you know, with, with regards to, to Kaimura waiting on this, we also have Bella. Now, 
Now remember, Bella is one of the sisters that was cloned based off X-23. And that was the basis behind her character's first story arc, the four sisters. Of course, you'll find that, that video down in, the, uh, down in the description. But with the four sisters story arc, it was basically Tom Taylor learning or telling us that X-23 had been cloned, engineered by what was left of the facility. And the result was that they were supposed to basically be the next stage of assassins. They were supposed to be X-23 duplicated, much the same way that X-23 was a clone of Wolverine. Of course, this led to uh, these sisters escaping, coming into contact with uh, Laura Kinney. Laura Kinney kind of teaching them a better way, but then, you know, Bella kind of being uh, taken by Kimura, being brainwashed, kind of forced to choose between loyalty and so on and so forth. But the idea here is that Bella very much is allied against Kimura, or at least it seems to be the case. But again, aboard this pirate ship, what we end up finding out is that by way of Laura Kinney spying on, uh, on the captain, kind of listening to everything that's going on, that this pirate ship is actually smuggling people. Now, that's just the nature of Madripoor in Marvel Comics. That's how dark Madripoor is. Gambling, prostitution, crime, drugs, I mean, the whole nine yards, that's all part of Madripoor. It's a criminal's paradise. And that's probably the reason why we haven't really seen it in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, because I have a hard time believing that with Disney being as family friendly as it is, that they would say, yeah, let's have Madripoor, this criminal's paradise that deals with like smuggling and drug running and different things like that. It would it would really sully the image of, of Disney in a lot of ways. And so, you know, it's understandable that they wouldn't, you know, roll that into their cinematic universe. It's really one of the reasons why I haven't talked about it before is because, you know, we try to keep things as family friendly as possible. And Madripoor is about as far from being family friendly as you can get. Uh, I may make a playlist at some point that deals specifically with adult oriented content and nothing else. And that's where we'll have like, you know, Punisher Max and stuff like that. But until I do something like that, you know, Madripoor will kind of be a story that I stay hands off of. But again, the cool thing about this is that Tom Taylor doesn't really take like the injustice approach, right? He doesn't, he's not really focusing on like a darker character, a darker nature to Marvel Comics. He's still focusing on, on the idea that X-23 is still very much a hero in the traditional sense. And so what this does is lead to, you know, again, the arrival of a guy named Rough House as well as, uh, as well as Bella, as well as X-23 facing off against the two of them. Now, of course, Bella basically says, look, these smugglers, whatever it is, their sole job was to bring X-23 to us, but we're not okay with them smuggling children. So of course, Bella's, you know, response is you're going to take these children back to the U.S. When the captain says no, Bella kills the captain and tells the second in command, you're taking these kids back to U.S. and Rough House is going to be there to monitor your actions. Now, with the character of Rough House, he's kind of this weird scenario in the realm of Marvel. And the reason why I say that is because of the fact that he's never really been fully fleshed out. He was just kind of there one day. But there's been these, these indications that he's tied into like Asgardian mythos, that he's not a, not a human being, that he's actually a god, that he maybe he's like a, a human god hybrid that's basically a mutant. And but Marvel's really just kind of used him, used his origin story, or really kind of modified his powers to suit whatever's going on at the time. And in truth, he's never been so significant of a character that fans really had a reason to ask why. Uh, you know, I've, I've never really had a reason to question that. I've been like, okay, cool, it's him. You know, he's this guy that's super durable and super capable and has super strength and speed and so on and so forth. But he's really just very much a throwaway character, you know, basically from what we can see in this. But with X-23 being taken back to Kaimura, Kaimura basically says, look, you were the perfect experiment. You were better than Wolverine in every form of fashion. We saw that when X-23 and Wolverine met for the very first time during Target X and X-23 over, like she overshadowed him. She fought, she outfought him. And so because of that, it created a really cool situation between the two. But, you know, Kaimura says, I'm putting you back in again. Like I'm putting you back into the brainwashing, you know, situation. I'm going to expose you to this trigger. So we're going to get you back to being an assassin again. And so what happens is after a week, X-23 is dropped off uh, within a building in, uh, in Madripoor itself. And the reason why is because there's a woman here named Tiger that wants to move Madripoor, uh, again, move it away from being this really dark and clandestine and mysterious place with a bad rep to being more or having more of a role in the international community. What this has done is drawn the ire of, Ky of Kaimura alongside other people who would pay to see, uh, you know, Tiger, uh, Tiger removed, eliminated from the equation so that Madripoor can maintain its status quo. Now, of course, this leads to X-23 being dropped into the building, being exposed to the trigger scent, you know, going against uh, going against Tiger. But in the middle of all this, of course, Gabby shows up, having engineered her own escape from the ship, as well as Gambit, along with uh, really all new X-Men. And the reason for this is because of the fact that X-23 served alongside all new X-Men. And so really, it's kind of them grabbing her and bringing her back in, saying, hey, look, you've got to regain yourself. You've got to figure out what's going on. But the overarching goal is to actually cure X-23 of her issue with the trigger scent. And that's why Jean Grey's here. And that's why this works, is because when it comes to the trigger scent, what it does is it sends her into an animal state. Well, if it sends X-23 to an animal state, then what happens to her conscious mind? And that's what X-23, I'm sorry, that's what Jean Grey's here to figure out. It's really kind of a joint effort between Jean Grey and Gabby. Again, because 
because Gabby's basically a clone of X-23 with all the powers of Laura, healing factor doesn't really have as many claws, uh, which seems to be an interesting thing. The, the claws seem to reduce by one with each new generation of clones based on Wolverine. <laughs> but what ends up happening here is, uh, is the goal is to basically send Laura into an animal state and then have Jean Grey enter the mind of Laura to find out where her conscious mind goes. And then working alongside Gabby, the idea is to basically bring Laura back to her normal self and have her try to keep from killing anybody, nullifying the effects of the of the trigger set. Now, of course, this coincides with the arrival of S.H.I.E.L.D. Because remember, S.H.I.E.L.D. is still looking for Laura because S.H.I.E.L.D. still believes that Laura killed all those people in Daysville. And so again, it's, it's interesting because at this point in time, remember the, the all new X-Men version of Angel, of Warren Worthington, is still in a relationship, still in love with X-23. Now, I want to talk about this for a second because this is something that I think might have thrown people off. We just kind of whizzed by it here in a second. But to sort of touch back on this, for those of you guys who aren't wildly familiar with, uh, with, with Marvel Comics, when it came to the run of X-Men, what Marvel did is they sat down and they said, okay, since Magneto's basically a good guy and Charles Xavier's dead, let's start moving Cyclops in the direction of giving him more character development, of having him be more than just the field commander of the X-Men. Let's basically make him a bad guy. And it was actually some really good storytelling in my mind. I mean, I really love the idea of Cyclops becoming a bad guy, basically becoming the new Magneto. And what ended up happening is Brian Michael Bendis crafted all new X-Men based on X-Men Battle of the Atom, or no, no, was it Battle of the Atom? I don't remember exactly what it is. I don't think it was, I keep wanting to say Advent Children, but Advent Children was a Final Fantasy movie. But what ended up happening is uh, is basically Beast uh, grabbed younger versions of the X-Men, brought them to the present day in an attempt to show Cyclops how far he had fallen down the rabbit hole of being a bad guy. The issue is that Brian Michael Bendis will do stuff, like he'll bring new things in and then he'll just walk away from the project. And so then suddenly we've got all these plot threads that are kind of out there and they'll never be wrapped up. And so Marvel was just sort of left with this younger generation of X-Men trying to figure out what to do with them. And that's where the all new X-Men line of stories came from following Bendis' original run with the, you know, the first volume of all new X-Men. But the idea here was to basically take, uh, take Laura Kinney, pair her off with a younger version of Warren Worthington, give her some personality development, different things like that. And it worked out pretty well for what it was. But switching back over to Jean Grey, what we find out is that whenever it is that Laura is exposed to the trigger scent, she devolves back into her childlike self. And that's really what Tom Taylor's saying here is that despite all the, the pomp and circumstance, despite, you know, despite all the bravado and everything that, that X-23 puts on, she's still a scared little girl. And this scared little girl, this element of who she is, retreats into her one safe place, which is Sarah Kinney reading her Pinocchio while she was in the facility trying to teach Laura to be a person. And this really shows us a couple things. One, it shows us how much these moments meant to Laura Kinney, despite the fact that in these early days of her life, she showed no emotion whatsoever. But it also shows us that this is a place that Laura doesn't want to leave, that she wants to stay here, that this is where she goes when the screaming starts, you know, when her, when her animalistic nature, when her subconscious is running through and just killing all these different people, that Laura's mind just hides. And then when the screaming dies down, then she reemerges because in her mind, everything is okay again. But with the arrival of Jean Grey kind of trying to force her out of this, what this does is it sends Laura into a rage with her own conscious mind when she says, you know, I said, go away. And what this does is snap her conscious mind back in control of her body. And in doing so, basically establish that Laura is now in control of herself, that the trigger scent no longer has an impact on her. And so it's actually pretty cool. It, it works out pretty well in terms of having her step into her own. The problem with this, or I guess the reason why Tom Taylor did this is because of the fact that the trigger scent was this holdover, that it just never really had anything done with it. I mean, it was, it was, it was great, but let's be honest, when it comes to comic books, there's only a handful of inherent weaknesses that belong to characters that can stand the test of time without ever being changed. Really, the only one that comes to comes to mind, as far as I'm concerned, is Superman and Kryptonite. You know, green Kryptonite will forever be the weakness of Superman because the two go hand in hand. But the trigger sense not Kryptonite. Laura Kinney is not Superman. She's not a character that can just stand, you know, the test of time forever. There have to be changes. There have to be modifications. There have to be expansions. There has to be growth with regards to her. Otherwise, she grows to be stagnant and people just stop caring. And so again, with X-23, with S.H.I.E.L.D., with, you know, the X, uh, all new X-Men basically rescuing Tiger, uh, Tiger, of course, she's here alongside them. But X-23 is basically trying to find a way to infiltrate Kaimura because Kaimura is basically showing up on the doorstep of the X-Men. And this shows us how brazen she is, you know, how fearless Kaimura is. Now, she's going to show up on the doorstep of the X-Men and S.H.I.E.L.D. and say, I want Laura, bring her to me. Now, of course, this is entirely possible. With Kaimura having indestructible skin, super strength, so on and so forth, she's a one-woman army. I mean, if she wanted to, she could take out every everyone here. Jean Grey might not even be able to stand a chance because as far as I'm aware, Kaimura has mental blocks that prevent people with telepathy from being able to take over her mind. And so she's, she's 
quite literally a person who could just cut a swath. A lot of you guys have been saying that my catchphrase hasn't been in videos recently. She's a person that could cut a swath through the entirety of this team and just take X-23. So in truth, her offering and saying, hey, look, bring her to me and I will let you go. It's a courtesy that she doesn't have to afford. But what ends up happening here is, uh, is Tiger, of course, goes to, uh, goes to Laura and says, hey, look, you know, I basically stole an Iron Man suit off the black market, or at least I bought an Iron Man suit off the black market. Uh, it really seems to be the most recent version of the Iron Man suit that, that seems to have been sold once Tony Stark had essentially died. But what ends up happening is, is X-23, of course, dons the suit, takes off, goes to encounter Kaimura. Now, this also coincides with the remnants of the X-Men facing off against like Bella and so on and so forth. But everything seems to come to a head. It's really this really this this amazing fight on the beach. And the reason why is because every, every ounce of pain, every ounce of anguish, every ounce of, of hatred and feeling used and feeling abused that Laura Kinney's had all gets poured out on Kaimura. And that's what's so ironic about this is because they fought so many times. And like Kaimura was just this character that just seemed to represent the insurmountable odds of Laura Kinney kind of becoming a better person, the insurmountable odds of Laura Kinney defeating the darker half of herself, that every time she went against Kaimura, Kaimura would always win the fight because she had indestructible skin. The easiest way, and the one question the fans always asked is, well, if Kaimura has indestructible skin, but she's just like Luke Cage, like her organs are not indestructible, you know, she still has to breathe, she still has to do those things, like drown her or poison her or kill her any way that you, the same way that you would kill Luke Cage. And that's what happens in the middle of this fight. You know, Laura Kinney's like, you know, you may have indestructible skin, you might be unbreakable, but you still need to breathe. And she literally just drowns Kaimura. I mean, she puts the entire weight of her, of her body into it. You know, all her rage, all her anger, and just drowns Kaimura. And in doing so, that's the end of her. Kaimura's gone. And that's a cool thing because this story was really just designed for the sole purpose of doing that. Bella is basically taken away by shield because of the fact that when the, the entire incident in Daysville happened, when the trigger scent was dropped on that small town, that Laura Kinney had actually punctured her own brain with her uh, with her claws and knocked herself out. Because of that, the entire situation had basically been framed. Bella showed up in Dalesville and killed everybody there. So Bella's actually the murderer here. It's basically a way for Tom Taylor to kind of remove her character, remove what's left, clear every, you know, clear the air, clear everything out, and leave with only Laura, allowing Tom to kind of move into the next era of storytelling without all these holdovers, without all these different things just kind of murking the waters and and you know making this this really uh difficult scenario with regards to people trying to chart the landscape of, of x23 but again it's pretty cool for what it is you know i really like to see this this sort of come come to an end see a lot of these old stories these old characters kind of move away because it was time that somebody finally said look let's just finish these old arcs that nobody ever bothered to finish before but if you guys are new here to comments explain make sure you hit the sub button to become part of the rob core if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and yeah <laughs> i will catch you all later peace